So the biggest risk of death when you swim the English Channel was hypothermia. So I had to gain a lot of weight. So I gained about 10 kgs of fat. They would come up to me and be like, oh, you've gained weight. You're not going to be as pretty or you're not going to be as attractive. Or they'll be like, oh, you're too ambitious. You're never going to meet someone. You're never going to get married. Or I think I think you just need to like focus on other things. Like this is like... I got a point where someone came up to me and goes, you are brown, you won't be able to swim the challenge, a channel. They actually said that to my face. I didn't fit into a box and they wanted to fit me into a box. So they, I got a lot of hate from it. So you're someone who's very active in a sense of like, charitable giving and charitable causes yeah. so you spoke about like going to schools you've raised a, a loads of money for um causes that matter to you such yeah. as like cancer research for example no not cancer research yeah yeah oh, cancer, cancer research, research is for children and young people oh there we go so it's just like a division of cancer research UK. Okay, yeah there we yeah go, there we go so i was close then. yeah yeah um where did that heart for like charity and giving come from would you say so when I was really young, mm -hmm. I think this is, I was really blessed. Like not many people, I think for me, I knew my purpose very young in life. Um, my parents are like of Indian heritage. So I moved back, to, I went back to India for the first ever time when I was seven. Mm -hmm. So I think when I went back there, I s like saw poverty, like dead, like straight in the eyes. And was like, I was in Delhi traffic. I was back, I was like on the way to like a five star hotel to have like, like a luxurious lunch in air conditioning like conditions with my family and we were stuck in Delhi traffic and there was this little girl that came up to the window and was like knocking on the window and she was holding this like little girl that was slightly younger than her and she was like gesturing for food and I've got a younger sister um and my heart just broke at that point because I just was like I'm the same age as this girl I have the same color skin as this girl like why is my life so different to this young child and I wanted to do something but I was seven so I was like well, well what can I do it when I'm seven years old um and I was talking to my mum about it and she was just like well what what's big and important to you and I was like well chocolate sweets and fizzy drinks like that that's like my highlight of my day when I get to come home and have to, some chocolate after school and she was like okay so I was like okay I'm going to give up chocolate sweets and fizzy drinks for a year so at the age of seven I gave up chocolate sweets and fizzy drinks yeah. and I was like I raised, I think, about a thousand pounds. That's a lot at seven. Yeah, at seven, that's like quite a lot of money. I think I had a lot of support from my teacher who actually, I actually, in the beginning, I wasn't going out to be like, I want to um, raise money. I, it was more like, I want to raise awareness, personal sacrifice. And then my teacher was the one that was like, okay, let's start raising money. And then I raised a thousand pounds and then I went back to India the year after and I bought Braille books for the local blind school um, for, the, for the children there. And I think at that point is when I was like, when I witnessed their faces and saw the joy that they got, it was almost a bug. And I was like, oh my God, I need to have this, like, I need to help. This is, this is my purpose. And I was seven years old and that's quite young. And I think from that point, I was like, I know I was put on this earth to give back and help as much as I can. Cause I've been put in a situation where I'm so blessed that I'm like, I was always, I've always been very talkative. I've always been like someone that's like, loves to connect with people and I want to use that to help people. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so I, I, from that point on, I just did lots and lots more and that now I'm here today, carrying on doing it. That's so. awesome, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, it's weird because I remember my first experience of when I went to Nigeria, I'm Nigerian heritage. Yeah. And I was about the same age, seven or eight. Um, I maybe was older, but anyway. I don't know, like I had the, if it felt, I felt so different from everybody. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I was able to see like the difference in terms of like, okay, here's where I've come from, here's my privilege. And it gave me that sense of appreciation of where I've mm. come from. And then fast forward like 10, 10 years later, I ended up going to an orphanage like off West Africa and um, mm. East Africa, sorry. And um, there I was able to spend time and spend Christmas over there. And it was to this day, probably one of my most favorite Christmases because being in an orphanage and giving them something as simple as just like beans and rice, where to me it's nothing, but mm. to them it meant so much. And I can definitely relate with that feeling of like giving, you know? Mm. But when there's so many causes that are out there, how do you decide which one to spend your time, your resources, your money on? What really is close to you, would you say? 
Mm. I think for me, it's always a children's charity. It's always mm. going to be linked to the next gen. So everything I do, there's like a theme, like if it's my talks or if it's like kind of my book or whatever, it's always related to children because I feel like they're the next generation and they're the ones that are going to be like the next leaders of the world or yeah. the next it, politicians, the next whatever it is. I feel like that was always been my focus, mm -hmm. but I'm very particular about the charity I, I support because I want to see the front line. I want to go to the front line. I want to be able to see the work they're doing. I will never commit to anything unless I've physically gone to India to see their, their work or gone to their labs, like the Fran Francis Crick Institute in King's Cross. I went to the lab and I met researchers. Wow. And so until I see the work that's being carried out, I won't commit to anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I've seen that work and I see the impact and I know where my money's going and I've, I think also there's always a gut feeling. I don't know, like I use this example when I go to schools and it's when like you go, when kids, when you go round, I don't know if you ever got this feeling, when you go around your secondary school and you do an open day and then you, you feel like, oh my God, I love this. I can see myself. It's that gut sensation. Or when you meet someone for the first time, like maybe when you're on a date or something and you're like, oh, I've got a gut sense, this is going somewhere and I've got a gut feeling, or you meet a business partner and you're like, we just vibe and we've got this. That's the feeling I get when I find my next charitable course. Yes. I get that sensation of like, this was meant to be. There was something here and there's, there's something that's pulling me towards you. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's the sensation I get when I like find my next thing. Got it. And is it always to do with like donating money or doing things to raise money or even like, have you thought about working for a charity to an extent? Yeah, I have thought about working for a charity, but I think for me, I want to be able to support multiple causes and I want to be able to support something and then raise awareness. So I talk about every single project I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I do I do it like a charitable Danish show or I'll raise something, but I also talk about it. Yeah. So I'll go and be like, this is what they're doing. This is what's happening and like raise awareness around the subject. Mm -hmm. I've never thought of going into one particular charity because I feel like there's a ripple effect and I feel like if I can talk about 10 charities and then those 10 and then I go and that person talks about 10 and there's like and then it's like a ripple effect and then I'm I'm spreading more messages about more yeah. like different charities so never thought of like working for one but yeah I think I I love the fact the variety too mm. so it's awesome. good and then I'm going to go back because you said about your purpose and you said your purpose is about what giving back to people yeah how did you marry up that purpose with say choosing what career path to go down I always think that you have to be able to know on really challenging days when you're in business or whatever you're doing in life, you have to know your why or you have to know what's going to drive you in the morning. So I think I was very blessed that my, my mother in particular was always being like, I don't really give a I don't mind what you do in life, but I want you to do that you're something that you're passionate about. Because when you have passion and when you have purpose, if you have those two pieces together, you will set the world on fire. So I I made decisions from a place of what my purpose was, was to give back and make a difference. So when I was in a board meeting, when I was making a decision about what, what direction the business was going to go in, I was always coming back to that, what is my purpose? Okay, is this going to make sure that I make a difference if the answer is yes I will make a decision on this mm -hmm. which is why I fell very naturally into my my company and what I do mm -hmm. now because it gives back and it supports different communities and so yeah I was very blessed to be able to find my niche with my use of my purpose and I think anyone could do that whatever yeah. your purpose is you will like like it will everything will move out the way the universe will come to you and you will it, it will fall in your plate when you when you have so much focus and clarity about what your purpose is mm -hmm. got it and um because before you started your business you was working at eware mm -hmm. right so you're doing tax yeah yeah so whilst you were there doing tax advisory or whatever it may be did you have that burning desire in the sense of like i should not be here mm. Well, like in the sense of like, because you weren't working on your purpose on a day yeah. day to day basis. Like, what kind? What was going through your mind? Would you say? Yes and no. So I think one thing I've learned in my life is patience, and one and I think you need to execute at the exact right moment. I think if you execute on a certain plan or decision at the wrong time, like it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. I did a child psychology degree, so I knew 
the moment I stepped into that classroom, my first lecture and had my first lecture, I was like, I know I want to do something with children. And that never changed, even when I was at EY. But what I made the active decision was in year two of university, I was like, I want to set up my own company. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to balance a balance sheet. I don't know anything about P&L. How am I going to make a multi-million pound business when all I know is the childcare side of things. So I made that decision of like, okay, I'm gonna get internships in like the big four, like the accountancy firms, I'm gonna apply for investment banking so that I can get the exposure to the corporate world. And then I've got more strings to my bow. So then I did an internship at EY in my second year, and then I got onto the grad scheme. So then I was like, I knew stepping onto that grad scheme that I was like, I know what my purpose is and I know where I want to be. But I also know in this moment, I need to learn and grow and develop as an individual before I step out into that world of the business. Because that was just my decision. Some people are like, I leave school and I know that I have gut feeling that I'm going to set up my business and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think it was a confidence thing. And I needed to have that experience for a few years whilst I was at EY. For about two and a half years, I qualified. I did my qualifications. I... I learned how to like professionally write an email and like all those kind of things that you just, sadly, you don't really learn. When I was at school, you didn't. It's a bit, it's slightly different now. And I was like, I need to understand that first before I go into the business world. Mm -hmm. So it was all part of my plan. And I, I learned a lot more soft skills that I needed for my business during that period. But yeah, I always had at the back of my mind. Yeah, that's interesting. Because sometimes, right, when you're in an organization where you're learning, you're growing, you can even see how you're developing as an individual, like you're getting a big team. And although you have the vision to set up your business, you might have thoughts in the back of your mind saying, okay, maybe I can have the business on the side. Maybe I can stay for a little bit longer. Did you have those type of thoughts? Absolutely. How do you deal with them? Of course, like, I think you're only natural. Like I had a salary. Yeah. Like, you have a salary and you're like, I'm, I'm going to walk away from a salary to set up a business where I'm going to hustle for like 12 to 18 months and I'm going to have nothing. Mm. Of course, you, you have those thoughts and those thoughts come in and, and it's also about managing that and being like, allowing yourself to be like, I'm a human. I'm not, I'm mm. not invincible. I'm like, those are going to come in and they're going to come out. But also like just staying, okay, maybe it, it is a decision that I want to stay here for slightly longer or I want to do it. Like, and that's on a day-to-day basis. You wake up and you're like, okay, does this, it, does this serve my purpose? Is this mm-hmm. making sense? So when those things, when those feelings came up, I was like, I'm not ready to jump ship yet. I'm not ready. It's like, actually my gut is telling me that I need to learn a little bit more. I need to stay here. The moment I decided to leave EY was so black and white. It yeah. was like, I woke up one morning and I was like, some, some couple of decisions happened during the day and I was like, this is the day I'm handing my resignation. And nothing, it was so clear to me. And there was always like ups and downs whilst I was at EY, like, should I stay here? I, I could partner track. Mm. I'm like, brown, I'm a woman. I, I could easily like, they'll accelerate me. There, there, was, there was those thoughts that went through my head. But I think it's just coming back and being like, that's short-term happiness. My long-term purpose here, I'm going to be miserable if I go down this route. Mm. So, yeah, I think as a human, you're going to have those thoughts and it's okay to have those thoughts too. Yeah. What were the things that happened on that day when you handed in your resignation? Um, I wasn't valued. Mm. That was the day that we all, we had all passed our exams. We had got our kind of like gone through the tick box exercise of like doing your exams. You've got your certain amount of um, hours that you had to work for your qualification. And I didn't get promoted. And I knew... Mm. One of the biggest things for me, what I knew was I was learning to value myself. Yeah. And I would no longer take someone not valuing me for hard work I had done. Yeah. And I'm not someone who's going to scream and shout about the things I've done. I'm going to sit there with grace and I'm going to work damn hard and I'm going to let the, sh- the results show. And that was the moment I didn't get promoted and I knew that was in the wrong place. And I, I don't know if you're very spiritual or religious or however the world, I knew in that moment that I'd been pushed in the direction and be like, you weren't supposed to get this promotion because your life's supposed to be out there. Yeah. And I, there was a reason behind that. And that was where I was like, I'm not valued here. I'm off. See ya. Yeah. So when you made that decision to yeah. resign, did you tell your family? Yeah, straight away. Straight they, away. they already knew. Oh, they already they, knew. Yeah, they as in like yeah. they knew where I was going to be. They knew, I, I'm very, very close to my, fa- my yeah. family. Um, we, my mum's a life, cons- like a, a life coach for executives and my dad has been in the finance industry for years and we're very close. We have like a lot of family meetings and all this kind of stuff. So sh- they knew my journey. They know my path. Mm-hmm. And yeah, actually, 
I, I, they knew that it was going to come at some point. So when I picked up the phone, I said, I'm, I'm handing in my resignation. They were like, okay, <laughs> Go for you're it. about six months too late, but all right, <laughs> <laughs> you're good, you're good. And did you have an idea for the business at that point? Um, n- yes, but also no. Mm. Um, I knew I wanted to set up something in the childcare space. Initially, I actually wanted to set up nurseries. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had the idea of setting up children's nurseries. I had saved a bit of money, so I knew I had about three to six months space of research time. Yeah. Um, so I left and I did a bit of research and I was like, okay, how is this going to work? What's the investment I need to put in, et cetera, et cetera. And I, it, that was the point where this was back in what, six years ago now. So it was like working from home was like happening but it mm-hmm. wasn't like a thing it was like the cool forward thinking companies were doing it but like the average like very like middle level companies were just not like there was no way that they yeah. were working from home yeah. so that started to develop and I was like well I throughout the whole of my time at EY what re- one thing that really ticked me off the most was the fact that parents in general not just mothers but fathers were not getting promoted and recognized because they were parents. They were in the sense that they had commitments, they had to leave early, or they, they had to do things outside of their workplace, which meant that they were, had to miss a meeting or do something. And I, and I could see the correlation between their progression in their career and being a parent. And that was something that was always really, really important to me and being like, why, why is this still happening? So when I decided to leave and do all this research, I found out that, okay, I could do it set up a nursery, but that's that's happening everywhere. But what people aren't doing is that working is becoming a little bit more flexible. We're doing a bit more working from home. Why is childcare not? So I was like, why is no one doing mobile childcare where you just pop up and provide childcare wherever is required? Um, and, I, and I realized, I did a bit more research and realized no one in the UK was doing this. There was a couple of companies that were kind of talking about it in America, but no one here. Um, that is when I realized, I, did, I spoke to a few people and I realized, okay, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I want to provide mobile childcare in corporate locations so that parents could drop off their kids at the beginning of work or the end of the work so that their career progression was not going to be hindered for that that their parents. Nice. Yeah. Big, big, big vision. Yeah, huge. Yeah. <laughs> and where did you start? Because you haven't got any qualifications. So what was the first move that you made? So I was qualified in the sense that like I understood the childcare space. So mm. I was qualified like as a like a technically like a nanny and all that kind of stuff. I knew a lot about like pediatrician, like uh, all that kind of stuff. But I wasn't, so where I started was I just asked, like worked out where my niche was. Mm. So initially I was doing what B2C, which business to consumer. Um, so I was actually going out and doing like weddings and doing, um, going out and doing that side of things. Yeah. Um, so that was going well, but it was just, business strategy wise I wasn't getting reoccurring contracts I was getting the one-off wedding and it was amazing it was a hearsay and then it would be the next wedding but I needed something that if I'm growing this business as anyone that's like an entrepreneur knows that they need regular income they need annual contracts um so then I went down I made the decision to pivot my business to going to b2b Mm -hmm. which is where I went down the corporate route um and then I was like signing one-year contracts. so how I got my first business contract was actually really interesting I hadn't got signed a contract in about four months at this point and I was literally like oh my god oh my god I have no revenue like maybe it was silly to do the pivot like what's going on here um so what I decided to do is I was like I'm going to go down the route of members clubs so have you heard of Annabelle's it's a yeah, private yeah, members club yeah. they're the most prestigious members club out there so their sister um their sister restaurant is called George. And at the time they were doing some sort of children activities on a Sunday. And I walked in and I said, look, can I speak to your um, head of events? So she introduced me to the head of events. And I said, hi, you're not going to know me. My name is Leah. I set up a company called Pop-Up Party and Play. We provide mobile childcare and entertainment. I want to be able to, I want to be able to provide this high-end deluxe service. Give me a chance. She's like, "Mm, not sure. And I was like, I will do it completely free of charge give me a chance and if your members stay longer than they normally do and if your children are happier just just promise me promise me you'll give me one paid event that's all I ask if one paid event if those two criteria come about she's like okay fine one <laughs> one weekend free of a charge next weekend this is the theme do it I was like fine I was like oh my god this is, this is so stressful so I was like pulled out all the stops did everything 
I, we had 95% capacity of members until the end of the, the lunch slot and they were literally being taken out and the kids were so happy. They were like, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? I got a call from the head of events the next day being like, right, we're going to sign an annual contract with you. So I got us every single Sunday for the wow. entire year based on that free, that free event. Wow. And at that point, I went to every single other members club in London and be like, I've got, sister, I've got sisters, uh, Annabelle's sisters uh, members club. I've got the best members club in London. So I'm like, give me a chance. Yeah. And it opened up so many doors. And that's how I like went from B2C to B2B. Wow. That's yeah. Incredible. Yeah. It's weird, especially going for like a free opportunity and it still led to so much business. Sometimes you have to go for the experience over the money. Absolutely. Wow. So how did you think about like building like, your team? Because was it just yourself at the time? Initially, yeah. So you were doing like the management, the operations and the delivery. Yeah, yeah. Everything. Wow. One stop shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you do. You have to at the beginning, yeah, right? Like yeah. where's the revenue coming from? I can't yeah. pay anyone unless I, unless I got a co-founder in. Mm. But I think what I did was so unique. Till this day, I haven't found another person like me that's like business savvy and got that understanding of the childcare space and children and that unique blend. And I think that's what made Pop-Up Party and Play very different. Mm -hmm. um, and I could have probably brought in someone that's a bit more business orientated or a bit more child, but I, I loved what I did and I didn't feel like I needed that support. Mm -hmm. I felt like I probably needed a more support on the marketing side, but I felt like I understood the business element. Yeah. Um, so at the beginning, yeah, for the first about six to eight months, it was just me. And then I brought in nannies on zero hour contracts. And like when I needed them, pulled them in, they were full time teachers or like part time nannies. And they would work and help a lot of my events initially were just small weekends. So it was mm. just extra work for them. And then I started building out my company. So then I had about five full time staff. And then we got to the point where we had 150 nannies. And it was, yeah, so it was a, it's a big old company wow. um, at its peak. So yeah. What would you say has been the highlight as you were growing that company? Um, the impact I was making. Yeah. Always the impact I'm making. I think one of the, the highlights of my career was when I did a pop up at WeWork. So I they provide us with a like a, a meeting room and we provided like a week worth of childcare over school, like half term. Mm. And it was access to every single member that was in the building. And um, one of the members had dropped off their two children at the beginning of the day. And at lunchtime, they came and picked them up. And this mother was like, literally on the brink of crying. And I was like, oh no, she's had a really crap morning. Like what's happened? Did it? So I was like, pulled her aside and I was like, is everything okay? Like, are you all right? And she goes, Leah, I don't think you understand what you've done I was like oh no <laughs> what has my nanny done who said what and I was all the negative thoughts went through my head and she goes Leah uh, because of your childcare over half term I have been able to afford to book my first ever holiday with my children because it's outside school holidays and they're gonna I'm gonna take them on their plane a plane for the first ever time and they've been asking me for the last five years and I've been able to do this opportunity because you've been able to pop up here and I don't have to take holiday over school holidays wow. And I was just like, to be able to just like give people the opportunity of like exploring the world or doing something that they could never have able to do because of my facilities and what we do, mm -hmm. it's just amazing. And I think that's always been my highlight. Like bottom line is great and it's amazing. Um, but like going back to my purpose, it's always been made a diff making a difference. Mm. So that's, that's it, yeah. So did you feel that the business was doing its job in terms of scratching that itch of like giving back? purpose charitable causes 100 yeah. percent. yeah i think it was to like 75 percent of mm -hmm. me but i i always wanted i always did charity work so like even when i was at ey i ran the london marathon and then when i was um doing pop-up party and play it was a lot of that work but i was doing going out and doing a lot of talks still i was still supporting a lot of charity like i didn't do an actual event mm -hmm. or like a, a big like a sporting event but i was always like donating or doing stuff or turning up to events so there was still that 25 percent of me that was like because the people that I was in contact with were to a certain extent privileged. They had the ability that at least one working parent, um, it wasn't that bored, like the really low disadvantaged like background, like that's where it like lights me up. And mm. I wasn't tapping into that enough during pop-up party and play stuff, even though we were giving back. And as much as we could, we did pro bono stuff. Yeah. It's interesting you said that 75% was on pop-up and pop-up party and play yeah. and the 25% was on charitable giving. At what point were you focused on like yourself and not being burnt out and not feeling overtired? Because especially if you're giving yourself all mm. the time, it's easy to feel jaded as mm. it were. Like, did you have any experience such as that? It's interesting you ask that question because 
No one really does. Mm. I think burnout is, especially as an entrepreneur, an, an early stage entrepreneur, it is so common. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I burnt out, 100%. You, you do burn out. Yeah. And I, I realized too late in, on in the game. I think I'd got to the point where I was exhausted and I was like, I'm, I'm so, so tired. Ironically, it happened exactly as COVID hit. Mm. And my business was just like all of a sudden I do events yeah. overnight or everything closed down. So it was also a blessing in disguise where I just completely slowed down mm. and I had to, I was almost forced to. And I think if COVID didn't happen, I probably would have had to slow down the business to a certain extent or got more help in. And mm -hmm. um, because we were doing at that point, probably about 10 to 15 events a week. So it was intense. It was really, really intense. Um, so yeah, I think I, there was a point where it was burnt out, but blessing in disguise mm. everything got shut down and and yeah and yeah. and i had to take the break <laughs> so yeah blessing in disguise for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i want to go back to that but before that so you mentioned you've done the running marathon the london marathon um you've also swam the channel like there's a lot of these things like for me i'm saving up running the london marathon for when i turn 40 which is still a few years away because i'm like i want to save that for my midlife crisis kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah um what pushes you to take on such big events like because running the running the london marathon and swimming the channel crazy type of goals yeah. like what drove you to do those specific things i i go the other way around so i think of the cause and then find the event mm -hmm. so i i never went out and being like i'm gonna run london marathon i found a charity that i wanted to support yeah. and then was like i want to do something so mental that people are like, why the hell did you decide to swim the English Channel? Mm. And then I get to talk about the cause. Mm. So I go from the cause point and then find the activity. Um, so I've never like been like, I want to, like I don't know my next sporting event. I probably know my next charity and then I'll probably find the next sporting event or something crazy I'll do. But I go the other way around. I find my cause, find my passion, find my why, which is what I do with all the decisions I make. And then I'm constantly in a space of like acceleration, acceleration, make mm -hmm. sure I need to do this. So for the English Channel, what was your why? Oh, this is a very, I, till now, I signed the English Channel back in 2018 and till this day, I still get emotional telling the story. So I was at a point where I was ready to find my next charity. So I was like, right, going out, reaching out to people, reaching out to my network, what I want to do, like, oh, this is what I want to do. It's always been children, like, like next gen focused. Um, and then I got introduced to the British Asia Trust. The British Asia Trust is a trust that was set, well, it was set up by King Charles when he was a prince. And it's focused on supporting um, individuals um, in the South Asian community. So they introduced me to a project that they're working out in Mumbai. So I went out to Mumbai and I was like, right, I want to see what's going on, what, what, I, what I can do to support. And they took me into a brothel. So these women had been sold by their own families. So these women of very low economic backgrounds who were out in the village had been sold to men who had promised them a better life. If that was work, education. So their parents thought they were doing the right thing. So they were like, okay, they'll go and have a better life. They will do something that's like more meaningful than getting married off really early. Um, so these women had been sold and I went into this brothel and and it was, the conditions were awful. It was rat infested. There was electric wires hanging down everywhere. It was completely dark. It smelled of sewage. It was unbearable. Um, so I went into one of the rooms and one of the rooms, um, I say rooms, I worked out when I got back, it was the same size as a UK prison cell. Wow. Um, there was three planks of wood of which these women, three young women, were sitting on top of. And I, say, I genuinely say young women because they're probably between the ages of 18 to 22. Um, and they were sitting on these planks of wood and underneath these planks of wood, like pots, pans, their whole livelihoods was underneath. And these women, they were beaten and bruised, all of their arms. Like you look at someone, you're like, you are lifeless. There's, nothing, there's no soul in you. And I got to talking to one of them and, and she was like, I was sold at 14. So she was sold in, at 14 and she was brought into this brothel and she was tied to the bed for th two and a half years. She didn't see daylight for about four years and they're psychologically abused to get to the point where they don't have no feelings. So these pimps, 
that's what they're called, the women, the men that control, will so psychologically manipulate them to the point where they are just like numb and numb, like completely motionless. And I was like, I just couldn't believe this was happening. These girls were so young and they'd been so, and they've had, and at this time I was very similar age to them and I was just distraught. And I remember on the, the, like the door for it, I say it's not a door because there was no door to the room, but it was like a the frame. There was like a tally, like a cut in car, like the carvings and like tally marks. And I was like to the women, I was like, well, what is this? And they were like, oh, this is the amount of, um, we have to perform sexual activities on a certain amount of men. And if we have to get to a certain amount, we're freed. But what obviously the pimp did was every day they would change that number and he knew the number of clients that were coming in. So he'd be like, oh, well, you have to do five today, knowing there was only three. So he would like psychologically manipulate them to make sure that they were like motivated to mm. think that there was an element of freedom. And I was like, to the point where I was like, I feel physically sick. Like, I just cannot believe in the 21st century this has been happening, that you're being sold by your own families into this. And I just took a moment and I was like, oh, this is just really overwhelming. And then all of a sudden, all of these kids started running in. And these kids were probably like two, three, four, six, at maximum seven years old. And these, these kids were half Chinese, half black, half white, like fully Indian. And I was just like, who, who are these kids? And the women were like, oh, well, there are children. And I was like, what? It's like, and I looked around to the lady who was escorting me into the one that's um, t- brought me into the project. And she was like, well, they've performed sexual activities on clients fallen pregnant and had to give birth. And I was like, what? And I was like, so where, where do these, these kids live? Like, what? And they were like, oh, they, well, they, they sleep underneath the plank of wood with the pots and pans. So they witness their mothers being raped and abused on a daily basis. And they're four or five. And I was like, that's it, done. And I like burst into tears. And I was like, that's it, I'm done. Being a child psychologist, I was like, I cannot live in a world where children this young have to witness their mothers going through that on a daily basis. And I was like, I'm, good. I'm done. I wanna do something so absolutely mental that people are like, why have you decided to do this? So I came back and I did a load of research on loads of different activities and things. And I was thinking, climbing Mount Everest. And I was like, yeah, that, that has been done, but what has been less people have done swimming the English Channel. Less people have swam the English Channel. And I was like, no British Asian woman has ever swam the channel. So I was like, this is it. I found my thing and I'm, I'm gonna swim the English Channel and I'm gonna raise money for them. I take a minute there. That's a lot. Mm. That's a lot. That must have changed you completely. Yeah. I, I don't think you can ever unsee that. Yeah. Ever. So going into preparing for the English Channel, like that's definitely some kind of motivation. Like no matter how hard it is, some people are just going through something completely worse. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are like, how do you do it? How did you, how yeah. do you swim? How did you swim 14 hours and 44 minutes nonstop? Or how do you watch your mother being raped every day? Yeah. Uh, I think life needs to be put back into perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think in the challenging times, I had to think of that. And that's why going back to your question of like, oh, how do you find your sporting activity? The sporting activity, it's easy. never, it's, it finds me. Mm. I find the, the why. Um, so yeah, it's, it, you have to put everything back into perspective in that space. Yeah. You mentioned some challenges that you had when you were preparing for it. What type of challenges were those? So the training period, about 18 months. Um, it was slightly over, but it was like really intense for 18 months. So I did a lot of pool training. Being the UK, it's very cold. So <laughs> there's only a certain amount of months you can actually get out in open water. Um, so a lot of my water t- training was in in the pool, yeah. which meant a lot of chlorine. So I lost a lot of hair. There was a lot of impact on kind of like my overall, over, like overall health. Um, but also because I was doing open water swimmings in like swimming in dirty water, like the Thames, um, Thorpe Pit Park, the lakes out there, it was very, very like, I got very sick as well at the same time. So there was a lot of like physical elements to it that was very challenging like I got a lot of injuries etc etc but actually for me what probably had more of the impact was the mental side Mm. of things I've got surprisingly a lot of hate (laughs) especially through my Indian community um so that I think definitely was the biggest challenge why do you think there was so much hate um I'm I'm against the grain and no one really likes someone who's supposed to be in a box. They can't quite work me out. So I would go to functions and aunties would come up to me and say, so the biggest risk of 
death when you swim the English Channel was hypothermia. So I had to gain a lot of weight. So I gained about 10 kgs of fat. They would come up to me and be like, oh, you've gained weight. You're not going to like, you're not going to be as pretty or you're not going to be as attractive. Or they'll be like, oh, you're too ambitious. You're never going to meet someone. You're never going to mm. get married. Or um, I, think, I think you just need to like focus on other things. Like this is like... I got a point where someone came up to me and goes, you are brown, you won't be able to turn the challenge, a channel. They actually said that to my face. Yeah. Um, it's not really a, like, brown people, like, you don't tend to see many, like, Indian Olympic swimmers. Like, it's not, it's not really a thing. Like, cricketers, we've got it. We've got it covered, <laughs> we're good. Um, so I think I didn't fit into a box and they wanted to fit me into a box. Mm. Um, so they, I got a lot of hate from it. And... The most ironic thing is that those are the ones with my biggest cheerleaders at the end. Yeah. They were like, yeah, of course you did. I, I always like, believed yeah. in her. Yeah, of course you bloody well did. <laughs> You're the one that drove me. Yeah. So that was for me, probably throughout my training period, that was probably the most challenging part. How, well, one of it. How did you come over those mental hurdles, would you say? Um, I had a breakdown. Genuinely had a breakdown. So about six months before my swim, you, I, you have to do what is known as qualifying swim. So that's when you go out and um, swim for six hours continuously to qualify to swim the English Channel because it's obviously a very dangerous feat. Um, and so I went out to Croatia with my, with my coach and the day before I got into the water and to do a two hour swim. So I got in the water, water was very intense, very choppy, kept pushing me under again and again and again. Um, I was, it was about five to five to seven minutes in and I started hyperventilating. I was panicking. I started like crying. My goggles started filling up with water. Um, and my coach got so worried, he pulled me out. So after seven minutes of being in the water, I got pulled out and I broke down and I was like, oh my God, I had raised a hundred thousand pounds for charity at that point, hundred K for charity at that point. And I was like, how am I going to get in tomorrow and swim and do my qualifying swim? Because if I don't do that, I'm not going to be able to qualify. And I had a complete and utter breakdown. And I think at that point, what I realized was I need to reflect on what's going on right now. And I reflected and I was like, I've done all my nutrition. I've gone to all my physiotherapy. Physically, I had done all my training. Everything was perfect. So I was like, what the hell is wrong with me? Why can't I do this? And that is, and that moment I realized that this challenge was 50% a mental game and 50% a physical game. Mm. And I realized that I was not mentally prepared and I had done no mental training. And every single person that had told me that I could not do it had got into my head at that point. And I went home and I journaled all the reasons why I could do this swim. And I mentally like got in the zone. I, I was all night, I was like listening to motivational talks. I was missing, I physically was walking around my body language, everything was different. And I psychologically psyched myself up the very next day in the exact same conditions I got in and did my six hour qualifiers them. Purely because that mental shift. Yeah, that's amazing. What, how did you know to do those steps to build up your mental fortitude? I always been in per, into personal development. Yeah. I knew I, I'd, I'd done my Tony Robbins. I had done like <laughs> my self help. I was, I, I lived in the self help section in the library. Like I, I loved, I loved a lot of the podcast. I think I had a lot of theory. What I didn't have is the practicality of actually putting it into practice. Yeah. And I think, again, it was just my gut. My gut instinct kicked in. It was like, what do I need to do to get myself in the right state? I knew music always motivated me. I knew I always listened to other people and what they thought. I need to write down evidence based of how I knew I was good enough. Mm. So I think in those moments, I picked up techniques and things that I knew, but hadn't put them into practice and put them into practice that evening. That's amazing. That's awesome. So when it came to the actual swim, yeah, how was that? Oh, it was mental. It was great. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was absolutely mental. Was it easier than you expected? Um, was it easier than? No, okay. no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't easier than expected, but I was mentally prepared. Yeah. It was a different type. I don't know. It's it's a really weird feeling in the sense that when you go into something that's that ridiculous and mm. that extreme there is not there wasn't even a 0.5 percent chance in my head that this wasn't going to happen yeah and and when when i look at successful people in whatever every minute it is if it's a sporting activity a business activity podcasting they are delusionally 
uh, like I have a delusional mindset around how successful they're going to be in this. Uh, there was no, I was doing it. It was just a matter of when I was going to get to the other side, other mm -hmm. side and get to France. So because I had that mindset, it, that made it easier than it was six months prior when mm -hmm. I was having all those doubts. So yes, to a certain extent, mentally it was, but physically it was absolute it was exhausting. Like yeah. I was exhausted. I got in at 4 a.m. Um, in Dover, pitched back for the first two hours, really, really badly seasick. So throwing up while swimming. Um, so that was man that was really, really challenging. Um, jellyfish things. So yeah, the whole works, the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. And there's no breaks at all. Oh no, 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 no. So the Channel Swimming Association, which is the association that governs all the swims to make it official, they have like loads of rules. So one of which you're only allowed to wear a swimsuit, not a wetsuit, because it has to be as authentic as a first ever swimmer. And one of the other rules is that you're not allowed to touch anyone or anything during your 14 hour, like your swim. So yeah, you you have to tread water whilst you're doing like your feeds mm. and everything. So yeah, nonstop. What kind of thoughts are going through your head during those 14 hours? I'm just, I'm swimming to my next feed. I'm just counting my strokes. I'm, 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 I, you don't go in and be like, I'm going to swim to France. Yeah. It's like when you set up a business, you're not going to be like, I am going, yeah, you obviously have your end goal of like, I'm going to make this a multi-million pound business or I want to float or I want to ring my bell, whatever it is. Yeah, you have that, but you, you set interim goals, you set, smaller goals that is managed one psychologically then you can digest that mm. so I was thinking right there's different sections to the swim so you have your your English waters then you have your no, what is known as English shipping lane then you're known as your hard shoulder where there's no ships that are allowed to go and then you have your your French side and then you have your French water so there's five sections so you're doing 10 feeds or whatever in your in those each section so I'm just like right I'm swimming to my next one swimming to my next one I'm swimming to, and that's literally what you're going through because mm. you're just like you can't think of like oh my god there's France over there and sadly at one point I was taking a feed and my brother was on my safety boat and my brother turned around to me and was like Leah don't worry like we can see France I was three hours in <laughs> and my coach like punched his shot like don't say that to her she's nowhere near like so you can't you psychologically got to break that down mm. so yeah so when you do such a big goal like that yeah what's next because it's um like did it feel like an anti-climax as well sometimes no, no, yeah. this is going to live on. I'm going to, I'm yeah. going to talk. I'm, my poor siblings are like, we're sick of hearing the channel. You've heard, <laughs> you've heard this story about 700 times. It's never an anticlimax in the sense that I feel like I can talk about the story and there's principles I've learned from it, which I'm now going around talking about. The principles mm -hmm. of mindset, resilience, confidence, imposter syndrome. I've developed frameworks from my swim, which now I go out and talk about. Mm -hmm. And I go out and like try and help inspire people to do their English channel swim, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of an anti-climax, no, because I feel like I've now taken principles and now like put it into my life and I can keep going. So I, I'm i now ready to like inspire others to do their, ch what is known as their channel swim. Yeah. And how would you help people decide what their channel swim should be? Do you have a principle relating towards that? Yeah. Find your purpose. It mm. always, for me, it's always going back, back to your purpose. Like I, when I always say that something that excites you at 12 o'clock is great and you're going to be passionate about it if it's recording your podcast, but what are you willing to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning to do? Because if you're willing to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning to do it, that is your passion. Mm. You kind of like something if you do it at midnight, but if you're willing to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning, that is where you found your passion. And the moment you found your passion, you will find ways to work out what to do with it. If it's giving back, if it's inspiring, if it's like gonna, like I don't know, grow your business, whatever it is, that is where you start. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And um, one thing you said before was about people who kind of said you were too ambitious. Mm. How do you deal with that? Like, how do you overcome? How do you maintain that sense of like being ambitious without people holding you back? You know, especially within my Indian community, I found that, and it's actually surprisingly, I get it more from women than I do men. Um, even though there's the women will be like you're too ambitious, you're not going to meet someone. Like, I've met the love of my life, like, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> and he's the one that's like, get on stage, hurry up, use your voice. Um, and I always say that when I'm in that position, send them love. Send them love because they're seeing something in me that they are insecure about in themselves. They haven't stepped up, they haven't swam their channel, they haven't stepped into their power. And I'm reflecting that insecurity on them. Mm. So I just send them love. 
and I'm like, I wish you well. And I'm like, I ask the question back of like, what makes you feel that I'm too ambitious? And I asked that question back. I actually was um, at a, an event the other week, about seven months ago, um, and this lady came up to me. I was with one of my friends, and this lady came up to me, and she didn't know who I was, and she said hello to my friend. She knew my friend. And uh, my friend introduced me, like, oh, this is Leah. And she turned around and said, oh, my God, are you Leah Chowdhury? And I was like, yeah. I was like, oh, God, what the hell have I done? And she's like, oh, you're the one that, like, you're the author, and you, and you run your own business, and you swam the English Channel. I was like, yeah, yeah. She's like... But you, but you haven't mar got married. What, what happened? Wow. And I was like, I turned around to her and I was like, well, I'm actually trying to find um, someone who swam the English Channel, who's an author and it's also a founder. And then I'll get married. So if you look out for that guy, then and I was just like, I can't say, I can't say that. <laughs> Internally, I was like, I can't say that. And I was like, why do you feel that I need that to complete me? And she turned around and was like, because my mother said that to me. And that's when you realize that what people are projecting onto you is a lot more about what they're saying than what 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 I'm about so yeah. I just send them love yeah send them love that's cool especially moving in places where people have that kind of negative opinion on you but you still got to reflect your own self-love as well as the outward showing of love as yeah. well right um and you mentioned about confidence so sometimes when you have a big goal and you may not necessarily achieve it mm -hmm. How do you go about rebuilding your confidence and going for next, for day two, as it were? Yeah, I don't think you need to have a setback or failure to lose confidence. Mm -hmm. I think you can just wake up one morning and feel really crappy about yourself and lack confidence. You could, the weather, could, en anything can knock your confidence. So I think it's something that you need to be able to learn to build up quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And for me, Confidence is not actually a feeling, it actually starts with action. And what people don't understand sometimes when I'm speaking to, they don't understand is that you have your comfort zone, which is a circle, and then you have a wider circle, which is what you know is your panic zone. And people think that there are only two circles, but actually what there is is a slightly sm larger circle that's in between that's called what is known as your stretch circle. And if you wake up each morning and you get yourself out of your comfort circle and into your stretch circle, you build your, com your, your comfort circle more and more and more, and that's how you build confidence. Mm. Each day you do something that like builds your confidence because you're taking something out your, outside your comfort zone. And if you take at one action each day, I'm actually doing a challenge in December where every day of December I'm doing something that's out of my comfort zone because that builds your confidence. It starts with action. And when you're having those bad days and those days where you feel that, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to achieve this, I'm not gonna be able to do that, you go back to the things that you've done every single day that stretch you out your comfort zone. And that makes you realize that like, I can, this is the foundation of where my confidence starts. Mm. What's inspired you to do that December challenge then? Um, because I want to keep growing. Yeah. I want to keep going and I want to, I've, I'm now doing this full time, which is a scary thing. Mm. Like, oh my God, like to go from having like a stable income and all this kind of stuff to now be like, I'm, I just feel that I kept getting to situations where things didn't work out and kept pushing me in this direction. And it got to the point where a couple of months ago, it was like, uh, things didn't work out with a business opportunity and I was like I cannot be shoved in this direction anymore I've got to just grab it with the horns and take it and speak more and I got up and each day I was pushing myself out of my comfort zone and I felt like my confidence was getting more and more and better and I was like do you know what I want to do this as like I want to document this to show other people that if you take go out your comfort zone more on a regular basis your confidence will start shining and mm. I wanted to be that example which is why I decided that in December I'm going to do that yeah, do you miss doing business then the business pop -up I still do it I st it's still like pop up party in place yeah. still running mm -hmm. so it's still going And but also like doing this stuff is also there's an element of business around it like mm. you still got to like f find out where you're going to there's still strategy behind it you still got to work out what your, your who your audience is and all that kind of stuff so there's still a business element but pop up party in play I'm very blessed that I have like a number two that runs that mm -hmm. but I still dip my my toe in that I also still do fractional COO work so I go into businesses where I actually focus on female founders and support them to grow their business like I've been blessed that over the last four years we've raised over 10 million pounds in fundraising for different startups wow. and so I've supported them like grow and develop and so I still I, st I couldn't completely run like walk away from business so I, I do love that too but yeah this is my primary stuff that I do now and on that point of founders so when you speak to founders right what do you see 
holds them back because sometimes it might be imposter syndrome, it might be not big, dreaming big enough, it might be doing everything on themselves. What kind of challenges do you see that they have that they need to work on? Truthfully, it's ironic that there's not one thing. Because mm. if there was one thing, I would take that magic formula, I'd put it in a box and just give it to all my founders. I think everyone deals purely because of upbringing and life experiences. Everyone goes through different things. Like for me, I, it was a confidence thing for me. I was super outgoing, bubbly. Like I was the person that walked into the room and was confident growing up. I went through a really bad confidence period through my 20s and um, setting up my business. So for me, it was confidence. Whilst other founders, it's imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So I sit down with founders and I will have a conversation with them and I will work out with them as their COO. And I kind of come in as like more of a board position as well in that sense and work out for them what is holding them back. Mm -hmm. And most, I think the most common thing is imposter syndrome yeah. i think of female founders because i support a lot more female founders they feel like they don't have a seat at the table mm. so, what do you do to help them then um i tell them to seek out the feeling of imposter syndrome imposter syndrome is something that we should be seeking out what do you mean because I feel that we should all be feeling imposter syndrome because you know you're in the right room, because then you're growing, you're developing, you're around people that are better than you, who are one step ahead of you in your, their journey, and therefore you're willing to learn from them. So therefore you're in the right room. If I'm in a room where I'm not feeling uncomfortable for too long, I'm in the wrong room. So I tell them to seek it out. I've never heard of that concept before. I like that way to think about it. Yeah, yeah it's like seeking, seeking the opportunity to feel uncomfortable. Because then you're in the right place. And the same with confidence. I yeah. seek out that that out of that comfort zone mm -hmm. because I'm building I'm building confidence. I'm I want that feeling. Mm, got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Because yeah. Because you've um, also spent a lot of time. Like what I've noticed when I was doing my research is that you've cultivated quite a strong brand, like personal brand, right? Yeah. And because you have that, that can open up so many different doors for you. Yeah. And because you're a very capable person, there's a lot of different things you can do as well. Yeah. How do you decide what to work on? Is it go back to your purpose or are there other elements that kind of come into play for you? Um, yeah, I think it comes back to impact. I think for me, I make decisions on how can I make the best impact? So now what I've decided after swimming the English Channel is I wrote my children's book, Making a Splash. And everyone said after I saw on the English Channel, what's your next thing? And I said, yeah, I could probably go do another big feat. And yeah. I could raise money and I... I was very blessed that I raised 155,000 pounds for, for the charity for Swimming the English Channel. But what if now I could inspire 10 people to swim their 10 channel and go give back? I could then write, raise 10 times 155K. Mm. Um, so I come back to when I'm deciding what to do on a daily basis of how much impact I'm making. And that's where my decision making lies now. Got it, got it. I like that. I like that. So I've got a couple of quick fire questions for you. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have some water for you. <laughs> yeah, all good. All good. Um, when you think of inspirational people... Sorry. When, so, you think of, sorry. when you think of inspirational people, who do you say inspires you the most? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, who inspires me the most? I know this sounds so unbelievably cliche, but my parents, mm -hmm. they were... They came, so my mother was born in India, came over here when she was a couple of months old, and her father died in a car crash very suddenly when she was about eight. And her mother was in her 30s, wasn't educated, and she had three additional siblings. She became a father figure at the age of eight. And her elder brother um, went into business and has become a multi, like very, very successful, both the brothers. And, but she stepped into that role very, very young. And she has, she is an inspiration to me. And she has called, she built her own business. She's an author as well. And she has taught me a lot of the principles that I've gone. So I think my mom and my dad are probably a big, big inspiration for me. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, if there's one particular failure or setback, that has propelled you to where you are now? What would you say it was? In business or in charitable giving? I'm gonna say both. Micro failing. I fail, 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 fail. I don't have one. Yeah, obviously my big failure when I, I, I in this channel swim in the, the day before my qualifying swim, but I try and micro, I 
fail, I try and fail as often as I can and adjust and adapt my approach. Mm -hmm. So again, like imposter syndrome, I, f I seek it out because if I, I want to micro fail as much and as fast as I can so that I can learn and adapt and make my product, my strategy as best it can be. If you had to name your superpower, what would it be? Mm, I have unbelievably amount of like hustle and resilience. I will get up and I will get up and I will get up. If it's rubby relationships I've been in the past, if it's failed business ideas, if it's swimming the English Channel and feel like I will get up, especially with my mental health. That's something that's always I've really struggled with in my life. I've been up and down and up and down, but there is. I, I will get up and I will work harder every single day. That is that's probably my superpower. I'm willing so, to hustle. Okay, so on that question, so what's been the tool that's helped you manage your mental health? Um, I, my one tool I would say is to be kind. Really be kind to myself and understand that I'm not going to have all the answers and understand that this mental health is a journey. And it's something that you are going to go through your, the whole, your whole life. I actually was listening to a podcast the other day where um, someone was saying that, oh, I go to therapy and I've gone to therapy for 10 years. And the interviewer was like, oh, maybe you should get a new therapist. <laughs> and the, she replied being like, no, actually, like the gym, I go to the gym every single day to build my muscles or et cetera, et cetera. I'd carve out an hour every week to mentally make sure I'm checking in with myself. And I'm gonna do that for the rest of my life. And I'm going to make sure that I'm in a place where I'm protecting myself and it's it's a constant thing and I have the luxury to do that. And I think that comes back to my mental health, like be kind and it's a journey. And it's gonna be like, just enjoy it because it's gonna go on for the rest of your life and that's okay. Awesome. If there was one piece of advice that you'd leave the world with, what would it be? Um, give back. I think for me, it's just, I don't know. I think maybe that's for me. I'm just like, spread your message. You don't. You can give back in so many ways by smiling someone on the tube, by offering a, a hand of comfort to a friend, by giving someone grace when they make a poor decision in a, in, in a, a meeting. I think being kind and giving back as much as you can is something, especially with everything going on in the world right now, is something that everyone needs. That's awesome. Leah, this has been an amazing conversation. It's where me start thinking about what I'm going to do to start giving back, you know? Like, what tips would you say about people if they want to find a charitable cause or anything like that? What would you recommend? Um, i just do your research. Yeah. Do your research, and I would say whatever, like, pulls you. I always found, so the reason why I've done Cancer Research UK for my book, because the net proceeds of that goes to Cancer Research UK and children and young people, was actually because my dad was, my father was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, and so that was something that was close to my heart. And mm. then I decided, okay, what charity can I support? And then I was like, it always goes back to children with me, which is why I did the children arm. So find something that like maybe touches you and do research it and go out and find out actually what they do because there's charities out there that like say that they think they do stuff but actually go out and find out a little bit about what they do a bit dodgy and um where can people find you if they want to learn more about what you're doing instagram yeah. all on instagram i think that's where I, most of my stuff is and my website's up there my link to my books on 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 my instagram so mm -hmm. yeah just leah chowdry on instagram follow me please also if you've got questions or thoughts slide into my dms they're please always do. open i'd love to talk to people it's like makes my day so yeah <laughs> please amazing leah it's been a pleasure thank you so thank much thank you so much cheers